Helen is the UQ Project Manager of Scholarly Communication and Repository Service. Today, Helen will talk about data publishing at UQ. Helen, over to you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I was really pleased when Natasha got me to talk about data publishing because here at UQ Library, we've been trying to build a bit of a solution around that, um, particularly for the long tail of research data here at UQ. So I have said it specifically about data publishing at UQ Library because I'm very aware there are some groups around UQ doing some fabulous work in this space, but I will focus very much on what we're doing here in the repository. Um, so thinking about data publishing really raises questions of why we're going to do it, how we're going to do it, how are researchers going to gain credit for the data that they produce, and um, particularly how they're going to gain credit it's separate from and in addition to the analysis of those data in publications. So what we're really trying to look at is really how we can build those meaningful con connections between publishing the data and publishing the, the scholarly work. It's actually um, my favorite part of the data lifecycle, data publishing, because it can be both the beginning and the end. So it might be that you're tidying up your data at the end of a project and looking to archive it. But if you go one step beyond that idea of archiving your work and you really start looking at depositing your data or publishing it, um, you really are giving sort of the start of another, of another project. You're really, really putting your data out there to become the beginning as well as the end. So there's been talk for a while now about making data a first-class scientific output. Um, here in this paper from 2012, they discuss achieving that through formalizing the methods for citation and publication, and thereby sort of incentivizing data sharing. And I think that's really important when we go around talking to researchers here at UQ, is to really make sure that they're understanding that the incentives behind um, sharing data, if we talk about the data with them about being a primary research output, that really starts to click with them, and they start to understand um, more often where we're coming from. Crucially, a point of difference, which we talk about with um, researchers, is around um, archiving data versus publishing data. So if when you archive your research data, that can be obviously very beneficial in terms of um, preserving the data. But when you publish it, it allows for things like validation and peer review of the data, which really enhances science as a whole. So we're, we're going to researchers and um, talking to them about not only the academic credit that they'll get, but also about that the results of their work will be verified by others, that they'll be able to um, expose their data to this idea of peer review, which to some of them can be quite scary, especially when we're talking again, like I said, to that long tail of research data, who perhaps aren't as familiar with this idea as data sharing as others. But that, um, you know, we're really trying to provide a mechanism to ensure the quality of data sets available. So at UQ, what do researchers want? When we go out and talk to them, what is it that we're saying that they want? They, they would like, I think, um, research data archiving, somewhere to preserve their research data, a way of sharing it, a way to publish their research data in a way that treats it as a primary research output. And that's crucial, I think, as to why we've implemented the data publishing um, infrastructure here in our institutional repository. We very much wanted researchers to feel that they were going through that process of publication in a similar way as they would with their other scholarly work. Um, we do talk to them about peer review and verifiable results, making sure their results are validated and reproducible, and the idea of getting academic credit. But I'm just putting all these words in their mouths. I'm not sure, do researchers really know that they want that? So when we go out and talk to people, we've done a lot of work in this area, and we're very lucky here in the library to have a team of librarians who work in research output services, um, as well as our client service liaison librarians. So we're able to go out and talk to researchers um, about what they actually do want. So we did a couple of things. We've continually evaluated our data management service since 2014, as well as collected user stories from people. So they tell us that the largest ever data sets they work with perhaps aren't that big. You know, we are really trying to provide this facility here for people who don't have other options, who aren't working in these big, big areas, which perhaps provide these nice, fancy um, workflows for them. So they're telling us they're not working with huge data sets, but that they have many different types of data. That their storage locations for archived data are a little concerning, that they will store it on their external hard drive or on their computer. So we know they want to preserve their data and they want to save it into the future, but that perhaps they're not, they're not sure about how to do that. We know that 53% of them wanted to keep their data permanently. So the idea of data archiving isn't something that they're adverse to. They're, they're happy to keep their data permanently. 
but it's taking that next step and actually publishing the data, sharing the data that perhaps we're trying to facilitate. So these are some of the real user stories. Real researchers said this, these aren't things I've made up, and that they want to store their research data in such a way that others can cite it. That seems to be really important that they get credit for their work. That they need access to institutional repository storage solutions for the data, as required by the journals they intend to publish in. So we did a bit of um, an environmental scan recently where we looked at, for the past five years, everything that UQ has published. We analysed that the, those publications by um, journal and by funder. And then one of our data librarians went and dug out for the top 25 journals um, by productivity, so by sheer number of publications at UQ, um, and also by um, overall time cited, so you could say by an overall um, total number of sites for papers in certain journals. So we got two lists of top 25 journals, one for productivity and one for overall time cited. What we found were those policies for those journals, um, only 7 out of 25 in terms of sheer weight of numbers required data sharing, still a lot, 7 out of 25. But in the highly cited or you know um, journal list, of the 25, 18 out of the 25 had a data sharing policy in place. So we know that UQ researchers are publishing in journals, um, a huge number of which, 18 out of 25 of which, um, are requiring them to share their data. So this researcher here is unusual and the most frequent phone call we're getting at the moment in the team is people who are trying to publish their research data in a journal that's requiring them to deposit their data somewhere and they're looking for a solution to that problem. They also would like stats on who downloads their data, so that's a little bit more difficult to, to work through for them, but they are interested in who's looking at their data. This researcher said they needed to be able to securely store their sensitive data but also share it with other researchers and collaborators. So we knew that we had to build infrastructure that made um, sense to people who had data that perhaps needed to be mediated access. This person would needed to be able to permanently store their research data in a way that was open and accessible in order to meet the requirements of a funding agency. So as well as analyzing UQ's research output by journal requirements, we did the same for funding agency requirements. We looked at all the funding agencies named on UQ research outputs in the last five years and we found that there are multiple um, funding agencies that are putting this pressure onto researchers to make sure that their data is open and accessible. That's both um, Australian ones as well as international ones named on UQ research publications. We knew that they wanted to store and accommodate all their research data along with everything that goes with it. So they need facility to upload data dictionaries, metadata, lab notebooks, so that it can be used by researchers in the future. So these are all really great um, user stories to come from our researchers. These are really good use cases that we're able to accommodate using our institutional repository. And I do think that over the, over the years that we've been here and talking to researchers, very much the conversation is starting to change, and we really are changing that terminology now. So people are beginning to start to talk to us about data publication instead of data sharing. And the conversation is really, I think, the start of a culture change here at UQ, which is, I think, very good to see. And the idea that researchers should share data to advance knowledge and promote the common good is quite an old idea, but in recent years, you know, we're really seeing a lot of enthusiasm from them. I think because people are starting to look at how um, they can get that academic credit and how it can lead to very much a conversation around research integrity and an audit trail from raw to published data, but then also from the published data to the publication. And I think that's where you get very strong trustability. And this is what we're working towards, is um, really the idea that data is deposited alongside and at the same time as publication of any scholarly output. So at the time that a UQ researcher is publishing a paper, that we give them an easy workflow and a trusted system for them to deposit the data that goes along with that publication and link the two things together. And really by integrating the data publishing with the other publishing, we're giving them um, real credibility and trustability. So it says here in this paper, data stewardship is best accomplished in systems and repositories where the custodian has trusted status within the relevant communities. And again, I think that's why it fits really well in the repository and really well with the library. But it also requires robust infrastructure that's quick and simple to use. And um, we first implemented the form, which I will show you very shortly, in, in our repository a couple of years ago. And it has gone through a number of iterations where we've tried to make it 
very user-centric and very um, straightforward for researchers to use. We do want them to do it. We want them to deposit the data. We want them to describe it. Um, so we're trying to make it so that they can use it and be confident that, it, that it's a straightforward workflow. So if it's going to become part of normal scientific practice, it really does have to be easy to achieve. So when researchers come and talk to us about um, publishing their research data, we will quite often talk to them about if there's a discipline-specific repository, because I do feel that those are very, very relevant to certain researchers. And we talk to them about, instead of archiving their data on their external hard drive, perhaps you know, go and use a, a, a specific repository like that. And we tell them also about UQE space. So the fact that they can actually describe their research data in UQE space. We talk to them about the idea that data that underpin a journal article should be made concurrently available. And we talk to them about the fact that we can link that data metadata record with their publication metadata record. They can be shown to be related objects. And I think that really does, they start to really understand then the value behind what we're trying to achieve here. And um, we make it discoverable. So we, we obviously send all our research data metadata up through to Research Data Australia. And then we also send that through to the data citation index. So we're able to track citations of the, their data sets through that, which has been um, really a key thing, I think, for people to really comprehend um, the impact that this can have, which is really good. So I'll show you a little bit more about how, but we have this need some extra help email data at library. So we have a generic email address there, which comes through to the team um, here in the library. We're very lucky to have some very skilled and specialist data librarians working here. We have, yeah, I suppose it's a relatively small team, but a very um, very dedicated team that work, work very hard to process these records as they come through and to really have those conversations with researchers articulating clearly the relevant funder and journal requirements and that they can use the institutional repository, that it's known, that it's trusted, that it can integrate with their other publication workflows and link to their other related um, publications or data sets. We try and really keep it very researcher centric and build them a profile of their data set. Um, we can give them DOIs for the data sets. We show them how to license the data set. We show them how to cite it um, and how they should be showing other people how to cite their data correctly. We still find a lot of people just either acknowledge a data set or mention it somewhere in the paper. So we're really trying to push that now it's a proper citation. And then, you know, we, we can do things like if their data is actually stored in a trusted subject-specific repository, we can link out to that. Or they can upload their data if it's a fairly small data set. They can choose mediated access to their data, or they can choose open access so they can actually link to it or upload it. Or they can just have a contact person so that, so that people are aware the data set exists, but that they would like to mediate the access to that. And we can also add an embargo period if required. So if somebody comes to us and says they need six months, 12 months embargo period on the data set, we can facilitate that as well. So this is what UQ Space looks like, the home page. And when you log in and you go into My UQ eSpace, you'll notice here you can see um, My UPO options. That's something that only an admin can see. So a researcher starts with the tabs My Research, possibly My Research, Add Missing Publication. Then they have two more options, My Research Data and Add Missing Research Data. And I really think by having the data sets up there in, in, in that prominent, along with the publications, gives the right message. It gives the status of research data as a primary research output. So they know they're getting the list of my research publications. They know they can um, claim publications that might possibly be theirs, and the system will present those to them. That they can add publications if they think we're missing them, but that they can also get a list of their research data, which comes like, it looks like this. It, the data sets below are currently attributed to you, and people really like this, this page. But then they can also go to add missing research data set, and this is what they get. They get um, it's a fairly simple form, and like I said, we've gone through a couple of different iterations, and we are actually looking to um, redesign all the forms in this space, at which point it will get a bit of a facelift. But I think we're pretty happy with the, the fields that we've got in there at the moment. So the person goes in, they add a simple amount of metadata, not too much. All the mandatory fields are up top, so they can fill those in and get, get a lot of that done very quickly they go through and they can add access conditions. So this is where they'll tell us if they'd like it to be open access or mediated access. And this is where they'll pick um, a license in terms of access for the data set. 
which we talked to them about in great detail because obviously if you're making your data available online, you need to make sure that you're releasing it under conditions that you feel comfortable with and that also allow for reuse. So we talked to them about what the different restrictions on the different licenses mean. Um, we talked to them about copyright and whether or not copyright exists in their data. If copyright doesn't exist in their data, which quite often is the case in Australia, we talked to them about UQ terms and conditions, which is a very simple thing that says, you could very well confuse my data, do anything you want with it, but I'd like you to attribute me. So we talked to them about various options around licensing in terms of access just to make sure that they're feeling comfortable. I think for some people it's quite a new idea that they're just going to put their data out there online or publish their data online. Then we go through various things. They can upload their work. They can add links to the location of data if it's for in Pangea or Dryad or another repository, for example. And then they tick a little deposit agreement that says they're the creator or the co-creator, that they're authorized to deposit it. They've got permission to include any third-party content that it's original, doesn't infringe any legal rights, and that by depositing it, they're granting new QE space, a license to reproduce it and make it available. And that the data that creators' moral rights will be to be associated will be respected by UQE space. And then before the record's published, it's checked by one of our specialist research output librarians. So every record that comes through, um, every time a researcher says, add missing data collection, they fill through the metadata, and um, it, it doesn't go automatically published online, it comes through to our team. Um, we check very carefully through the record and we quite often will contact the researcher and speak to them about the metadata that they've provided and make sure that it's um, a rich resource because I do feel if you're publishing data, the metadata you provide around it is very important and to make sure that that data and metadata is of a consistently high standard would be certainly an aim that we have here at UQ Library. So then you end up with a final record. This is a record from the eFish Genomic Database Repository. They're a great group here at UQ. They analyze all these amazing fish or sharks um, and they get all the genomic information, of which they say they use roughly about 3% of the information that they collect. And then they're very happy to make the full, full amount of information available online. And you can see here we've got the file actually attached there so people can just download it. And we also have a link through to the full text publication. So we're making sure that you've got that trail from the data set to the publication um, and also to any other related publications or data sets. And I do think that's the, um, the main thing here by popping all this information directly into the institutional repository. It's really giving us that advantage and that integration with, with other aspects of public publishing, which is where you're going to get the credibility, I think, with with researchers. This is the second half of the record. You can see they picked their Creative Commons attribution but non-commercial license. It tells you about the type of data. All very standard metadata but enough for you to go off if you're going to try and discover the data set. So in the future here at UQ Library, some of the plans that we have really center around creating more of this researcher-centric data management um, infrastructure. So we have a couple of different projects on the go at the moment and um, funded by the Enhancing Systems and Services um, suite of projects, I guess you would call them, um, here at UQ. They are trying very much to provide this umbrella and university-wide infrastructure that's really going to help researchers sort out their workflows. And that includes um, management and use of the data from a DMP all the way through to storage, preservation and reuse. So we expect this will tie in very closely with the existing information that we have in eSpace. We know from our user research that researchers require that easy to use infrastructure that's available to them at no cost and that allows for best practice workflows but with minimum administrative intervention. So we're not trying to give them an administrative task to do but we're trying, almost like Dom said, to be collecting that metadata earlier in the process so that by the time it comes to the end and publishing, they're not having to remember everything. That they've already got quite a well-established um, set of metadata by that point. So currently at the UQ Library, we do have a DMP online tool. There's no flow on a metadata from that into the repository. And there's no links to storage provisioning. There's no links to published record metadata. However, we are well positioned to capture that information in eSpace because we know we've got the, the infrastructure I've shown you now. We've got that complementary um, 
projects around data sharing, we know we can do the licensing, the DOI, we can send it through to RDA, we can send it through to DCI. So we know we're in a good position to do this. We've done an awful lot of brainstorming, and I like the little bit there on the wall that says can do. It's like we know we can do this. There's also one that says it's my data. I'm not publishing it, but I don't believe that one. Um, so we really are going to work towards thinking about um, having an idea of project level minimum viable metadata, which can be fleshed out into a DMP, which can have um, other information added to it. We really are at UQ trying to look across a huge number of different disciplines and they all require something slightly different and a few of them have different ideas as to what data publishing even is. So by keeping this idea of minimum viable metadata at the project level, keeping it very simple, um, that allows I think for as, as wide as we can possibly get at UQ coverage, although we're not trying to go for everyone. Um, I said at the beginning there are people at UQ doing this really well without us, so we, we're not trying to um, overarching trying to get onto get onto all of those people. But for the people that don't have working systems, um, the new system will allow research project level metadata captured in a DMP to cascade through the data lifecycle, automatically provision data storage, and then we can use that information to to publish one or more data data set metadata records linking back to the original raw data um, and also linking forward to a set of publications that came from that project level um, data collection. So I think that's a really good situation to be getting into and certainly that's the vision, although I think it would be um, not coming probably, I'm going to say 12 months, give me a year for this, but it's certainly the direction that we're heading in. And um, I've got a quote here from Vincent Smith who says, the power of published data is amplified by ingenuity through applications and uses unimagined and uses unimagined by the original and distant from the original field. Without connecting these disparate data sets, the true potential of data reuse and repurposing is lost. And that's from his paper on data publication towards a database of everything, in which he has the idea that perhaps we can um, I want to say coagulate everything into one large, huge database that can be queried and solve all kinds of interesting problems. So I really do think that publishing data is something worth investing a lot of infrastructure, you know, a lot of money, a lot of thought, a lot of infrastructure into. And um, yeah, something we're very excited to be part of here at the library today. Thanks, Helen. We look forward to hearing more from you in one year's time. But for now, <laughs> Susanna, let's move to the question time. Any questions? Uh, yes, there is one there. Is it possible that UQ can share their list of journals that require data publishing? I'm about to start working this out for the journals that ACU publish in and it would be great to have a central repository for this information. So Yes, I'm very happy to share that information. Yep. We did look very specifically at UQ publications and they um, and then slice the data just everywhere we've been publishing, but I'd imagine it would be very similar across the the university, so I'm very happy to share that information. That sounds fantastic. Um, so what software are you using is a question. Um, we use, it's an in-house, it's just the, what's used to build our institutional repository. So I do believe it's all open source and online, but yeah, it's all the in-house development stuff. Mm -hmm. Apart from the DMP Online, which is um, an implementation of the DCC's um, DMP Online from the UK. Okay. Obviously you wow them with your brilliance there, Helen. <laughs> That's all the questions we have for the moment. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for your time. Thank you.